I'm a firm believer in the old axiom that a nation or a people that forgets its history is doomed to repeat it. And uh, there are a lot of things about what's going on in our society today uh, that I feel like are a direct result of people, especially our young people, not really having a firm foundation on what this country was founded upon, the principles upon which it was founded. And uh, knowing what your family history is, uh, where your roots are, so to speak, I, I think that's sorely missing among most of our youth today, especially our millennials. But again, getting back to historical preservation, uh, I'm here tonight basically to speak to you about one of our uh, largely forgotten and unsung heroes of the early days of the Mississippi Territory and the formation and the creation of the state of Alabama, uh, Sam Dale, Samuel Dale. Uh, Dale was uh, instrumental in the establishment and the, the, uh, the pioneer spirit of the day of uh, those people who were moving down from the uh, 13 original colonies now states and moving into this vast territory which at that time was known as the western frontier. Uh, the Mississippi Territory, the uh, Ohio Valley, uh, the Kentucky and Tennessee areas, all of these lands were open for settlement after the uh, Revolutionary War when the British ceded all of these territories to the United States from the uh, Appalachian Mountains over to the Mississippi River. All of that was a uh, result of the treaty that was signed in 1783. Um, but Sam Dale was born in Rock Ridge County, um, Virginia, uh, the son of Samuel and Mary Dale, who were um, Scots-Irish. Uh, and uh, immigrants uh, from uh, those uh, parts of the, uh, the old country. Uh, Sam Dale early on had the pioneer spirit running through his veins and so uh, when uh, Sam was a very young man they moved to the Clinch Valley uh, which is over near the Tennessee line, the Virginia Tennessee line and uh, they settled there uh, and they were constantly moving southward and westward. Uh, they moved from uh, the Clinch River area because they were in constant fear at that time of the Shawnee and the Iroquois tribes who were constantly raiding into those areas and uh, murdering, burning villages and settlements and things of that nature. So they decided to move southward towards Georgia thinking that they could get away from all of that uh, uh, violence that was going on between the tribes and the uh, settlers of the uh, uh, the northern part of the areas, and uh, they settled in Greensboro, Georgia, in 1783. Sam's uh, father, uh, Samuel, Sam Senior, uh, bought a tobacco farm there near Greensboro, and they settled there in 1783. Uh, unfortunately for Sam and his eight siblings. Uh, his mother passed away in 1792 and his father, so stricken by the grief of losing his wife, died a week later from heartbreak. And so uh, Sam Dale Jr. was left at the tender age of not, uh, really under 20 years of age uh, being left to take care of eight siblings, one of those being a very small infant. And uh, of course they... Uh, they were in uh, very much debt. The, the tobacco farm had not yet been paid for, uh, so they were in debt to uh, the uh, credit holders for the uh, tobacco farm. He did have some younger brothers who were old enough to be able to work the farm, and he, he uh, credits divine providence and a lot of hard work uh, for their efforts in being able to pay that farm off in two years. At about that same time, Dale joined the territorial militia because uh, just about as soon as they uh, made that settlement and that migration southward, 
the creek uprisings began. And uh, so uh, thinking that they were going to get away from the threat of, uh, of uh, Indian raids and things of that nature, they just wound up flat dab in the middle of more Indian raids and hostilities uh, uh, among the uh, Creek Indians, especially the Red Stick Creek Indians. Uh, they seem to be the more militant of the two factions, the Red Sticks and the White Sticks. The White Stick Creeks uh, tended to be a little bit more um, amicable, I guess you could say, toward the uh, settlers that were moving into the area, but the Red Sticks were a very, very proud uh, group, and they, uh, uh, they did not want the white settlers coming in and taking over lands that they had held for generations uh, that they felt like uh, not only uh, were they so much part of the land, but uh, they didn't feel like you could own the land anyway. Uh, no one could own land. It was everyone. But these settlers kept coming in and taking over these um, large portions of land, and it was, it was creating quite a stir uh, at that time. Um, it was said of Dale that, uh, well, he said of himself uh, at the... Uh, at the time that his parents died, that uh, after leaving his uh, younger siblings uh, in bed weeping and crying over their parents' loss, that he went to his parents' graves and he uh, wept over and prayed over those graves as a, uh, a despairing boy. But when he returned back to his house, he went back as a tearful but resolute man. Uh, and so that was a quite a, as you would obviously think, it was, it was quite a, uh, it was quite an, uh, uh, an incident in his life that uh, he credits as bringing him from boyhood into manhood, and I wish you would understand that it would. Uh, he joined as a volunteer scout, and uh, during that time he was uh, uh, a part of the scouting party that went to what was called the Tukabachi Council, which is down in uh, Tukabachi being down in South Alabama. And this was the uh, event where the great uh, Shawnee War Chief Tecumseh uh, made a trip down from the Illinois Territory down into the southeastern part of the country to incite the civilized tribes against the white settlers that were moving in. Uh, Tecumseh was a, uh, a very, very prominent figure, as we all know in the, in the annals of history, uh, a great war chief. Uh, but he, he, had, uh, he was trying to unite the Indian tribes, all of the Indian tribes in the east, into a big confederation. Uh, in, th in hopes that they could drive the, right, the white man all the way back into the sea, as he would say it. And he, he uh, made overtures about even digging up the bones of those who had, the white men that had been buried and chunking them into the ocean after, <laughs> after the battles were over. Uh, they, Dale was a part of that uh, uh, scouting party that actually uh, made their way close enough to hear Tecumseh's speech that he gave. Uh, he made overtures about that he was, when he went back to uh, uh, his homeland, that he was going to stomp the ground and the earth would shake, and that his uh, that there would be a great light in the sky that would signify that uh, his uh, words were powerful. That uh, he was kind of like a god. That uh, whatever he did uh, would hold truth and whatever he said would hold truth. And uh, actually he had an ulterior motive. I don't think that he knew about one in, uh, instance, but there was a, uh, the British had told him about a comet that would be appearing in the sky at some period of time later on. And that, that appearance of that comet was Tecumseh's um, sign that he was all that he had said that he was. And the other one, I think, was just happenstance. But it just so happened that uh, not long after Tecumseh went back north, there was an earthquake in the area, and the ground shook. So all of these tribes 
thought that Thomas is a God and his word holds, you know, a lot of truth. And so uh, that was really one of the things that incited the Red Stick Creeks to go to war against the white man uh, in the uh, Mississippi Territory. And when we talk about the Mississippi Territory, uh, it's interesting to note that the northern part of what are now North Mississippi and North Alabama, those were Indian lands, and they were recognized as Indian lands. Most of those lands were occupied by the, uh, the uh, Chickasaw and, and to some degree the Creeks, I mean not the Creeks, but the Cherokees. The Choctaws were predominant in the uh, southwestern part of the Mississippi Territory, uh, and then the Creeks were in the uh, southeastern part of the Mississippi Territory. But at the time of the settlements, what, what we knew, what we know now as Mississippi and Alabama, the Mississippi Territory was actually the southern part of what we now know as Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, in fact, one of the things that uh, uh, Sam Bell was uh, a part of, and which I'll speak a little bit more about later, was the uh, he was part of the uh, delegation that was uh, formed to determine whether or not Alabama and Mississippi were going to be divided north-south or if they were going to be divided east and west. So, uh, just an interesting side note there. But again, uh, this council that uh, Tecumseh held with the tribes, that was really what incited the Creek Wars in the, eight, the early 1800s in this part of the country, especially in the southern part of Alabama and Mississippi. He had a friend with him named Will Milford, and we'll get back to that in just a few moments, but keep Will Milford in your mind as we talk about some of the events that will uh, go along uh, later and come along later. Um, at the Battle of Burnt Corn Creek, that was really the first encounter that uh, um, Sam Dale had with the Creek Indians. Uh, word had gotten out that uh, William Weatherford, who was a half-breed uh, chief of the uh, uh, Red Stick Creeks, uh, he and some others, uh, William McIntosh, I believe, was another half-breed, uh, they had gone to Pensacola to buy arms and supplies from the uh, Spanish who were still in control of Florida at that time, Spanish Florida. And uh, they had gone to Pensacola to buy arms and accoutrements and uh, ammunition for a raid that they were planning on the settlements along the uh, Alabama River in South Alabama. Um, uh, Dale and his uh, militia group got word that uh, they these uh, People were coming back up one of the trails coming out of Pensacola, and so uh, they ambushed these uh, Indians and really could have carried the day except that someone among the, uh, Dale's militia group uh, yelled retreat, and uh, there's, it's not known why, and it's not, it has never been known who yelled the word retreat, but Instead of uh, winning that day's battle, they actually just uh, kind of went pell-mell and everything kind of fell apart. Uh, a couple of three of the uh, militiamen were killed. And uh, so it was really, I guess, in a, in a way, a loss for uh, Dale and his troops. But uh, uh, it was something that he notes in his book as being very unfortunate because he felt like that they really could have carried the day, captured those supplies, and probably could have avoided some of the uh, raids that the um, Indians did in uh, the latter part of that year and that season. Dale is most famous or gained most of his notoriety for his canoe fight on the Alabama River. Uh, Dale and two other gentlemen and a... Uh, a freedman, a freed black man who was named Caesar, uh, they were out on a scouting party, uh, scouting to try to find um, William Weatherford, whom I've already mentioned, and some of his uh, uh, Indians who were raiding in that area and burning homes and settlements. Uh, 
they actually uh, ran upon some of those Indians uh, crossing the Alabama River. And Dale, I guess because his blood was up from losing that battle at Burnt Corn Creek a few weeks prior to that, uh, decided that uh, one way or the other he was going to have at those Indians. Uh, so he ordered Caesar, who was on the far bank, they had split their party and had gone across on both banks and they were going down the river parallel to each other. And he uh, called to Caesar to have Caesar bring a canoe over from the far bank so that he and Dale and these other gentlemen could climb in because they could see this big, huge dugout canoe coming up the river with uh, 11 red stick warriors in it. And Dale was going to go out and he was going to whip them as much as he, as he thought he could. And so uh, they, uh, Caesar rode the uh, boat across the creek. Uh, Dale and two other gentlemen got in the boat with Caesar. Uh, they uh, rode out into the middle of the creek and intercepted the, uh, the canoe. At that time, two of the warriors jumped out and then they were shot from the banks by some of the other militia men that were there on the banks. And then... Uh, as legend has it, I guess, I guess it's grown, uh, it grew very rapidly over the years, but uh, legend has it that uh, Dale straddled both canoes, one leg in one canoe and one leg in the other, and he himself single-handedly uh, killed five of those Red Stick Indians himself in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The other two gentlemen dispatched the other four that were in the canoe, and uh, that was where Dale got uh, gained his notoriety as the great as the Daniel Boone of Alabama. That was what he was called, and uh, that was his claim to fame. And there's actually a plaque on the Alabama River today, uh, down near uh, Ozark, somewhere in that area, that uh, commemorates the canoe fight on the Alabama River. But uh, Dale was a pretty good sized fella. Uh, from all accounts, he was about six foot two inches tall and weighed about 185 pounds, which was quite a sizable fellow in that day. Uh, the average probably being somewhere around five six or five seven and 135 to 40 pounds. So he probably stood out uh, among most men when he was around them. Not long after the canoe fight, I know that you've all heard of the Fort Mims massacre. Uh, William Weatherford was the leader of that raid on Fort Mims. It was a very unfortunate circumstance that probably could have been avoided. There was uh, a, a pretty sizable detachment of militiamen in that fort at the time that the raid occurred. Uh, they, uh, for whatever reason, didn't close the gates that day. Uh, and that night, just about dusk, Weatherford sent those uh, Indians in to raid the fort, and uh, about 250 souls were lost, men, women, and children, in that raid on Fort Mims. And it was not long after that that uh, uh, that's when really we can call the Creek Wars that's when they began in earnest, was after the massacre at Fort Mims. Uh, there was a concerted effort. Uh, the US, United States sent troops in to uh, help crush this uh, rebellion, this uh, uprising, as uh, it was called. And um, Jackson himself uh, got involved in it later on, President Andrew Jackson. But uh, a lot of what was fought, and of course we all know about Horseshoe Bend. Uh, but there were some raids by the militia groups before that. Uh, one of them was the raid on the uh, uh, the Holy Ground, which was to uh, the Red Stick, or well actually all the Creek Indians, the Kanachaka, as it was called, was the Holy Ground. And uh, another one of the things that Tecumseh had vowed uh, before he went back North, when they had that council, was the fact that if any white man ever entered the, into the holy ground of the Chanakaka, that the earth would open and it would swallow them up. Uh, that was uh, that was a place where no white man could ever set foot. Uh, 
but uh, Dale and his uh, militia group, uh, they, they actually uh, staged a raid on the Holy Grounds and uh, were successful in driving the Red Sticks out. Uh, that was where William Weatherford, who I mentioned before, uh, made his famous leap off the bluff on his horse from the Alabama River. Uh, he actually rode his horse, uh, horse off about a 20-foot cliff or bluff into the Alabama River, and that's the way he escaped being killed or captured. Uh, it wasn't very long after that, though, that the, uh, after, uh, especially after Horseshoe Bend, that the uh, Red Stick Creeks and the Creek Indians they finally decided that they'd had enough, and uh, that pretty much was the end of the Creek War. William Weatherford actually came and surrendered himself to Andrew Jackson, uh, much to the chagrin of a lot of the uh, militia and the, the U.S. troops in that area. Uh, Jackson released him, uh, which uh, didn't sit very well with a lot of people, but... Uh, uh, he had um, he told Jackson that he had had enough. He'd seen too much bloodshed, and uh, he was he was done. He was done fighting. So Jackson actually let him go. Um, and another side note, an interesting side, a very interesting side note to William Weatherford and Sam Dale. Uh, it's 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 amazing how war makes old enemies. Afterwards, it makes them the best of friends. Uh, Sam Dale was actually a groomsman in William Weatherford's wedding several years later when William Weatherford married. And so, you know, they were, if they had encountered each other during the Creek Wars, they would have been at each other's throat trying to kill each other, but they wound up being best of friends. And again, Dale was a groomsman in his wedding. Uh, after the Creek Wars were pretty much settled, uh, then we have uh, the history of the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans, uh, which uh, Jackson obviously uh, was a great hero of the War of 1812, one of the few victories that the United States actually had in the War of 1812. But up north it didn't go very well for us, but uh, Jackson's victory at uh, uh, New Orleans pretty much solidified him as a hero and obviously uh, would be a candidate for president as a lot of war heroes usually are. In his later career, uh, he was part of the 1817 convention that uh, divided the uh, Mississippi Territory into the states of Alabama and Mississippi. Uh, an interesting side note to that was, and I think I mentioned it the last time when we were talking about Marion County and its role in, in our nation, or in our state's history, was the fact that that north-south line between Alabama and Mississippi was not permanently established until 1821, which was four years after Mississippi became a state and two years after Alabama became a state in 1819. But uh, Dale was instrumental in that uh, decision on whether or not to divide Mississippi territory east and west, like Tennessee and Kentucky, or whether it was going to be a, a north-south divi division. Uh, and I think that probably the thing that made that played most prominently in that decision was the fact that both states needed access to the Gulf, and so it was divided north and south instead of east and west. Uh, they will serve two terms in the Alabama legislature, uh, and around 1822, one through uh, 1826 or seven, I believe. He also, at that time, uh, was appointed Brigadier General of Alabama Militia. And the reason I think that he was appointed uh, Brigadier General or commissioned Brigadier General was the fact that uh, due to his benevolence to all of those settlers that came into the Mississippi Territory at the time that he was a frontiersman, a pioneer, and he was also a guide for a lot of the settlers who came in. But uh, uh, he he uh, spent most of his money and uh, gave away most of his supplies that he uh, would 
gather uh, over the year, and uh, he would just give them away to these settlers to keep them from starving to death. So he actually came out of the war uh, fairly destitute, and I think that was one of the reasons that the uh, uh, the 